Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tembela Vogwana, and I am speaking from South Africa. Uh, South Africa is a country, and not only just a region, in the southern tip of the African continent. And I feel I have to say this because um, a couple of times in the US, people, when I say um, I'm come from South Africa, people would say, which country in South Africa? So South Africa is a country, and uh, probably most of you will remember South Africa as Mandela's country. Um, one of the most important genres in this country is choral music, or Amakwaya or Iguayala, and I'm, I'm going to be speaking on that. Uh, the title of my presentation then is Amakwaya Iguayala, History, Practice, Publics and Futures of Black Choral Music in South Africa. Um, this type of music called Amakwaya or Iguayala is largely written in vernacular languages which are Zikosa, Zulu, Sisutu, Isitwana, Ispedi, Isitonga, Isindebele, Nesvende. And that is the one that I'm going to be focusing on. And this music uh, is about 150 years old. And it is a product of um, meeting and encounters between uh, the missionaries and when they came to South Africa in the, eight, in the 18th and the 19th century they came and converted locals into Christianity and so it started in mission schools and it was taught in tonic sulfur and tonic sulfur largely had British origins um, developed by Cohen and it was used um, for choralizing, in, um, or, or rather for group singing in, in British um, setting, in the British society, especially for work, working class poor people or um, working class youths. So when it came to South Africa, um, it was one of the ways in which the colonizers and also the missionaries uh, worked towards um, converting locals into capitalism and also into um, cultural systems of the, of, of the empire, so to speak. And so, um, at the beginning, uh, there were the, some of the leading composers, such as John Knox Bokwe, um, Tio Soga, um, Enoch Sondonga, and a couple of others. And by the way, Enoch Sondonga wrote what became the national anthem of South Africa um, around 1895. The, f the first known copy of choral music was published by Love, Lovedale Press, which was a, a, a mission school in the Eastern Cape, and um, it was a Scottish mission school in the Eastern Cape, and it was around 1875. Um, but it is quite important to mention that not all of these mission schools were only just in the Eastern Cape, but rather the Eastern Cape uh, province in South Africa was the first place where these mission schools were established, but there were others um, in Natal province, and uh, such as um, Adams College and the Oshlanga Institute, and there were also others in places like Lesotho, and that one was um, linked to the Parisian Missionary Society. And so it was these mission schools, which of course were the only types of schools that were available in the 19th century for black people um, to learn, where choral music was taught. Um, contrary to most what people believe, that choral music actually started through tonic sulfur and it was hymns written in local languages and also locals learning to write hymns in tonic sulfur. But there were other influences, of course, um, to, to, to choral music or amakwaya. Some of these influences were um, music from, uh, especially vaudeville um, music from the US and, and also um, Victorian uh, part songs and local people learned to compose by learning these songs and then sometimes adapting themselves to local languages but also sometimes learning the systems of composition and writing these songs and writing them in, 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 in tonic sulfur and of course using their own languages. Um, what were the stories or what were the themes that were available or that were um, pervasive in these songs? Um, as it can be uh, expected some of the themes that started um, or that the, the writers, the composers um, put in these songs um, were those that were about religion, they were about God, but then as they got out of the missions um, they basically became stories or rather the texts were about stories 
and life as lived by the people. And so some of the themes are about love, some of the themes are about nature, and some of the themes are about chiefs and queens, and some of the things are really, some of the themes are children's play songs, um, and, and, and a whole range of other things, and, and reflecting and commenting critically on the activities of society. So the question that um, possibly people are interested in is, how were these songs learned? Um, they were written on, um, by hand, uh, by most composers. They were written by hand, um, written in tonic sulfur, which they had learned in the mission schools, like I said. And they were then, some composers um, had their own choirs. And some composers would teach these um, songs to their families, and then as soon as they figured that, uh, that uh, the song is okay, then they would give it to other con conductors. But some of the composers were also conductors, and so they would compose for their choirs. But in the long run, as I will mention later in the presentation, there were competitions, and a lot of songs were either commissioned or people would compose them, and choirs would um, do them as choice pieces, and then maybe later on they would be prescribed. Um, most choirs um, that were formed by conductors and composers um, were school choirs, but outside of school, um, the learned people, um, sometimes called the, 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 the middle class, the black middle class, um, they also conduct, um, composed themselves into choirs and they sang in what was called idimiti, or tea meetings, which were pretty much like um, what the British um, the colonizers would have, and during those tea meetings then people would come together, assemble, and sing choral music. And so there's a sense in which, um, when it, at, at its early days, uh, choral music was much more um, a, a form of entertainment for middle class uh, blacks. And sometimes they called it in music, or music, as opposed to other forms of music making that were kind of not always regarded as as, as proper. For instance, some people in the early days that were not particularly in favor of jazz and other forms of traditional music. Um, the earliest recorded uh, music was uh, by Taluza in the 1930s. Actually, the first recorded, he took his group, his quartet, and he went to England to record. However, the the choirs themselves, they had been traveling through the country because during concerts, that's where choirs would perform this music, but also they would travel from one part of the country to another doing fundraising. But it was not only um, moving between one town and another town or one rural area and an uh, to another locality, but also there were choirs that traveled abroad. And there is the Zulu choir, and there is the South African choir, and there's the African choir that toured to England and performed in England for the Queen even as far back as 1891. And so this connection between South Africa and the empire and the traveling of the sounds from South Africa is not really a new thing. So there was this constant um, uh, movement and of sound, of music between the empire, between the metropolitan areas and also the, the, the colonies, so to speak. And, 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 the, and this kind of music began to be heard in places like London as far back as the late 19th century. Going back to the scores, um, the scores of sonic sulfur were sometimes written by hand, like I said, but also sometimes people would have heard this song sung by a choir and they would um, transfer them or transmit them uh, orally and, and somehow sometimes one would find that um, songs kind of took a life of their own because they kept on slightly changing because they were now sung away from the score. And of course the earliest scores were written by hand but with time um, composers learned to use the typewriter and then they would typeset um, a writing in tonic sulfur and they would typeset their music. And so the early scores are like that. Um, it is important to mention that um, music for Africans, music for blacks, was mostly, there were very few black people who actually learned to write and sing in staff notation. And, and at a much later stage, staff notation was actually reserved for um, white schools, white education, and white people. And so in South Africa up to this very day, there's a very interesting dynamic in the sense in which 
um, the writing of music or the scripting of music it is, is kind of racialized because black people read and write in tonic sulfur and read and write music and sing from tonic sulfur whereas most white choirs and most white musicians they read and write in, 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 in stuff notation. But of course, with, um, with, with, with the change in the post-democratic South Africa, um, a lot of people who began to write music, they wrote in dual notation. So as you will see in the, in the, in the, in the PowerPoint that accompanies the presentation, you'll see that um, there is actually a, a, a sheet of music written in dual notation, whereby it is written in tonic, sol in tonic sulfur and stuff notation, so that those who cannot read um, stuff notation, then they can use tonic sulfur and the other way around. And what that has kind of done over maybe the past 25 years was to democratize the repertoires such that the, the repertoires of Ama choir are not only just sung by black choirs, and, and white choirs as well these days, they are able to sing this music because they can now access it and read in the language or in the musical language that they can understand. So at the beginning of this conversation, um, I spoke about mission schools, but what people need to understand is that um, over the years, especially at the start of the 20th century, um, people moved away from mission schools. Uh, there were more schools that were formed and that were established. And so it was not only just in mission schools that this music was sung, but also in just government-sponsored um, schools and, and also in community. There was also an, as a, a, an emerging community of um, choirs of choral singing in communities outside of school and also in churches. And one of the things that has happened that is very interesting is that there's a very um, the, the the culture of choral singing in this in, in this country in South Africa the culture of ama choir is very very pervasive in schools with school competitions but also in churches with church competitions um, interdenominational competitions and also in government departments there are competitions by government workers. And there's also choral singing in, in community choirs, and all of these I'll talk about. Some of these I'll take. I'll talk about them towards the end of the conversation. Um, one of the things that is perhaps quite important to say is that in the in the towards the end of the nineteenth century, um, in the last maybe four three decades of the decades of the nineteenth century. There was a discovery, there were mineral discoveries in, Joha in, 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 in the place that is now called Johannesburg, which is one of the largest cities. In fact, it is the largest city in South Africa and, and actually in Africa as well. And also in Kimberley, diamonds were found in Kimberley and gold was found in Johannesburg. It was first the diamonds in Kimberley and later on um, in the 1880s, the, 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 the gold in Johannesburg. And therefore what happened was that a lot of people who were products of mission schools, they went on to work in the mines, but some of these people were actually educated teachers that went on to establish schools in places like Johannesburg and also in places like um, Kimberley and in other emerging industrial cities such as Durban in the East Coast. And it was in these places that um, there was an interest in choral singing. However, as you all know, um, the government of the time was very much interested in controlling black people's um, activities and those were the seeds of apartheid legislation. And so one of the things that um, the government in South Africa was very much interested in was the idea of moralizing black leisure. The idea that um, if you give these people who are working in the cities something to do and give them activities to do, they will not be loitering around. So it was a form, it was a system of control. And so the idea was that give them cultural activities and let them be involved in some cultural activities so that they do not loiter around. And maybe also you can control them and so that they do not rise up against the state. And so in places like Johannesburg, for instance, there were places such as the Bantumben Social Center that was very much interested in, in creating choral performance and many, many other forms of artistic endeavors. And so the Bantumben Social, Social Center was one of the areas in Johannesburg where people were involved in choral singing. And during this time at the Bantumben Social Center, and this was around the 1930s, um, the, the, 
people came together, people like um, composers like Machikisa and also people like uh, Mr. Khadiba, they came together and they formed competitions. And so, um, real competitions, as we now have, as you will see later towards the end of the presentation, started um, in earnest around the 1930s. And then in the 1950s, um, for instance, people like um, the musicians like um, Kabim Ngoma and the writers such as Eskiam Pahele, they formed the Syndicate of African Artists. And this Syndicate of African Artists ran Eisteddfod in the, in the tradition of the Welsh, Welsh Eisteddfod. And so for a whole week there was reading of poetry, there was drama, there was theatre, but at the same time also there was a lot of music making, um, concerts and also competitions. Kabim Ngoma was one of the first black South Africans, for instance, to, to start a music department at the University of Zulu. But also alongside that, there were teacher associations. So um, in the 30s, uh, until in fact 1994 or maybe 1998, South Africa had four provinces. It was Natal, Free State, the Cape Province, and Transvaal. And these four provinces then had associations of black teachers, and these associations of black teachers um, came together and formed what was called ATASA, which was the African Teachers Association of South Africa. And through the activities of ATASA, um, ATASA ran school programs in choral music making and in choral music concerts and, and, and competitions. But also, ATASA, through teachers choirs, began to popularize adult community choirs. And so there were competitions for um, students, for, high, for schools, but also there were community choirs that were under the auspices of ATASA. And so um, this relationship between school and community and choral music making became something that was very pervasive in the cultural calendar of South, Af of, South of South Africa by black people. And it was in fact through the competitions that were run by ATASA um, that a lot of comp compositions were, um, were, 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 were written. And these were tested as prescribed music in these competitions but also sometimes um, choirs would choose choice songs of their own and they would get a composer to, to write something for them or sometimes a composer would write for a particular choir and give them to produce in the, um, to perform in these competitions. Um, the competitions for school, both schools and adult choirs were self-run and so schools would pay money and, and, and buy um, trophies, but there were no prizes, there, there was no prize money, and also the same thing with um, adult choirs. But much later, the Ford Motor Company, um, in, in, the, in the late 1970s, decided to come in and join this movement of choral singing in South Africa, of Ama Choir. And they, they sponsored the choral competition, and that was the birth, and perhaps the very first um, instance of a corporate sponsored um, choral, choral event in South Africa and this was called Ford Choir Competitions and the Ford Choir Competitions has been running um, since 1977-78 and it has undergone different sponsorships of course and now it is what is called the Old Mutual National Choir Festival which is really which draws choirs not only just from South Africa now but also from the neighboring states as far as Botswana, Zimbabwe, Swaziland. Um, what I did not mention was that most of the songs are in four parts, so they are for soprano, alto, tenor, bass, and sometimes there are divisions uh, in parts. Maybe it could be soprano, soprano, alto, or soprano, alto, two tenors, and bass. And sometimes there would be solo sections, uh, whether it is a single solo line, or sometimes it is a quartet. And of course, um, uh, the, the, the songs are directed by the choir conductor. And like I said, the themes are quite varied. And during the apartheid times, um, a lot of the composers were moved by the segregation and the oppression and the violence, the, the, the state-sponsored violence, especially towards black people. And some of the songs were, were, were composed to engage with apartheid. But what is most important to note as well is that apartheid as a very uh, a vicious um, policy 
was also very much um, onto censorship. And so songs that were regarded as, and not only just for Ama Choir music, but also for just every single genre of music within the South African context, um, songs that were regarded as being um, against the policies of the state, they were banned. And so composers sometimes, they really would use um, very veiled messages to engage with, um, with, with, with apartheid um, realities. But also during this time, there was emerging um, consciousness among black people. The idea of what is called black consciousness. Black people asserting themselves, um, taking pride in who they are, in their history, and, and of course going back to their roots and, 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 and celebrating their culture. And so, even though some of the earlier choral compositions were modeled from hymns and other um, Victorian soul, part songs, in the 60s composers began to incorporate um, aspects of traditional singing into their music and of course that has carried on um, until the present. And one of the leading composers, one of the leading exponents of that journey towards the roots or journey back to the roots was um, Mzeliga Zakumalo. And one of the songs that he actually did that in was a song called Uman Fit Gufa, when death, when I die. Um, that is the simplest um, translation of that. And there is a section there at Zia Gia, Zia Gia Zonge, where he tries to incorporate his Zulu traditional style of singing and dancing within the more normal, um, westernized kind of uh, compositional style or compositional framework. And there have been many other composers who have. Um, put in other various ways of engaging the realities of the time. Some composers, for instance, um, put elements of what is called doi doi, which is um, a marching style of singing and moving when people were fighting against the government. And people and, and composers began to have elements of doi doi as well in their compositions. <coughs> Um, it is also important to talk about the nature of um, choral performances in this country, or the nature of um, ama choir performances. Most performances by um, ama choir or iguayala uh, were done during concerts. So people would have concerts that, that are often for raising money. And the, both concerts and competitions would have um, a section where people would sing the local compositions, um, the, the, the Macquire songs composed by local composers and sung in the vernacular. And then they would also sing um, Western compositions and, and in competitions in particular where maybe two songs are prescribed, one song would be local, a vernacular piece um, in one of the languages and uh, in one of the local languages and then a Western piece mostly um, from the auditorios of Mozart um, from the from the masses of Mozart and the uh, and the auditorios of um, uh, Mot, uh, oh, sorry, the auditorios of Hand, Handel and 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 Bach and so on. And so there's always been this um, duality in choral performance, whether it's Western and African music. Um, it is also important to mention, and I forgot to say this at the beginning of my presentation, that just about all compositions by Macquire composers were unaccompanied. So these were four-part songs most, most of the time that were unaccompanied. And sometimes, um, like I said, they're SATB, but sometimes they're also TTBB. And some songs also are SSA, that is two sopranos and alto, or a soprano and two altos. Um, there is actually very less composition for children and for children's choirs. And which is a very interesting um, dynamic. Uh, there, 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 there are not very many composers who specifically write for children. Even though, of course, there are during school competitions, they are um, songs that are sung by children. Um, what has been happening since the post-apartheid dispensation is a very interesting trend and a very interesting dynamic. It is important to talk about Amakwaya and education in the, South, in the South African context. Earlier, at the beginning of this conversation, I said that um, tonic sulfur was used to teach black people to write music. 
and there's a sense in which then there has been a division um, in, in teaching black people, there's, a, there's been a division between writing and performing and reading music in tonic solfa versus in staff notation. Similarly, there has not been a long tradition of black education in composition at universities because in, during the apartheid period, most black people just could not get to universities that were offering music. And so there has been a much smaller number of people who actually got to learn music and, and train in music studies, um, except a few universities such as the University of Forte, the University of Zululand and the University of Transkei, who had very small music departments way back in the 70s and the 80s. But what has since happened at the end of apartheid is that all the universities, because of the, the current government legislation that is democratic, that is liberal, people can now get into universities and study music. And what has then been happening is that most composers, or some of the emerging composers, are now also adding piano accompaniment to these songs. And there has been a trend over the past 20 years of composers that put in piano accompaniment um, in, in their compositions. But also, another very interesting trend that has happened is that there's been an emergence in South Africa of operatic singing and so almost all competitions will have the Western piece being a, a, an excerpt from an operatic um, prescription or an operatic work and very much popular is, is operas of Verdi and um, the, 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 bel canto, the bel canto composers especially Donizetti and, and others. Um, so there has been that emergence and as a result most of the people, of the young people who come from choirs, who come from the choral tradition in schools and in the community choirs have gone on to study music and study opera and some of these have actually been on international stages and there is a sense in which then it is quite important to mention that Amakwaya or, or Iguayala has been a space that has led to the development of a very vibrant operatic culture in South Africa. And some of the leading singers who live overseas and perform overseas include, for instance, Priti Yende, um, who, is one of the who is pictured in one of the slides, um, Priti Yende, Pume Zamachigiza, Levi Sakhapane, and many other South Africans who live and work abroad. Um, also importantly, Choral music has responded to um, social dynamics in very important ways. One of those ways is to engage HIV AIDS. Um, the country has been uh, highly affected by the presence of HIV AIDS, especially over the past 20, 30 years. And what, one of the things that has happened in the school competitions is to have a section where students actually engage with HIV AIDS awareness in terms of um, how not to get HIV, but also what to do when you already have it, including fa facing stigma against uh, people who live with HIV and also the idea of positive living. But also within that context, what has been very much important is to ensure that within tra uh, traditional competition, within choral competitions, also there's this emergence of ensuring that people perform their traditional musics and dances. And so there has been this alongside the prescriptions of Mozart and, and, and Beethoven, Verdi and Donizetti and, and others, there's also quite a, this important emergence of um, choral tradition, of, of, of indigenous music performance in traditional garb um, as it would, be, have, would have been done um, in traditional and indigenous communities um, of the past. Um, these days also there has been a democratization of, of, of the orchestra, so to speak. And so some of this competition, in the past, orchestras played for white people. And so there were no orchestras that would go and play for choirs or armor choir. But um, presently, most competitions would have an orchestra. And as a result, composers are now also beginning to write in the vernacular, but also have works that are being orchestrated. And also local composers are beginning to write large scale works, such as cantatas, um, multi-movement works in local vernaculars, but also using the orchestra as an accompaniment. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, I think it is quite important to emphasize that the word amakwaya or ikwayala uh, or dikwayala, 
comes from the noun choirs, the English noun choirs or choir. And so this genre basically does not have another name except Amakwaya or Iguala, which is a localization or re registering in the vernacular of the word choirs. But what is important then is that what makes it different and particularly unique to the South African situation and the kind of music that I'm researching and writing about and interested in is that in some ways it is similar to choral music practice elsewhere in the world. But Amakwaya is particularly what it is and what it has been within the South African context because of it developing from the mission schools and from the missionary situation in the, in, in, in the, in the mission schools and in the churches and then developing by, through local composers and, and the dynamics of performance, its circulation, its, circuit of trans, its circuits of transmission is somehow different from what the white people have been doing and also Perhaps as a legacy of apartheid and separation in South Africa, um, black people don't always perform together with white people. And so most of the competitions and the repertoire that I'm talking about, that you're going to be looking at in the slide that accompanies this, uh, this, this, this um, presentation, these are usually black choirs in black competitions um, with no white people performing.